the AI for Good Global Summit convened by ITU recognizes the joint responsibility of governments, the private sector, United Nations agencies, academia and others to ensure AI reaches its full potential while preventing and mitigating harms. And it's a moment that calls for action. And today I'm calling on each of you, each of you to use this summit to help the world to better understand what kinds of regulations, what kinds of guardrails we need to put in place right now. So together, let's make it innovative, let's make it safe, and let's make it responsible for all. Thank you very much. Welcome to AI for Good, the leading action-oriented, global and inclusive United Nations platform on AI. Organized by ITU, in partnership with 40 UN sister organizations, and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the United Nations the sustainable development goals and scale those solutions for global impact. In today's session, we're counting on you to use the live video wall feature to ask questions and post comments to help create an engaging discussion. We encourage you to stay until the end to chat, connect, ask questions, and network with our distinguished panelists and world-class AI experts in the neural network. It is now time to kick off the session and welcome our first speaker. The floor is yours. Hello, everybody. My name is Sylvia Paul. I'm the head of the Digital Society Division in ITU, where we do all the work on digital inclusion, especially on gender. And I would like to welcome you all to the AI for Good webinar on unveiling sexist narratives, AI approach to flat content on social media, and it's organized by ITU in partnership with UN Women and UNICC. So we have a very, very exciting session ahead of us, but I will start with some opening remarks in relation to ITU. And it's really an honor to be here with you and thank you for, for also the kind invitation to be moderating, especially on the occasion that tomorrow we will have International Women's Day. As the UN agency for ICTs with the overall mission to connect the unconnected, IT has been working hard to leave no one behind and to make sure that vulnerable groups such as women, girls, children, and young people are included in the access and use of technologies. And for us, ITU's works to close the gender digital divide has been a priority for many years. And the recent fallout from the pandemic has been catastrophic for the lives of billions of, of people. And we also know that women are suffering disproportionately. They're more likely to have lost their jobs. They're more likely to have had their long-term educational prospects compromised. To, mass to maximize its impact, on society and economy, IQ talks about digital connectivity, that it must be universal and meaningful. This means that when it's universal, it means connectivity for all. And when, when it's meaningful, it's a level of connectivity that allows users to have a safe, satisfying, enriching, and productive online experience at an affordable cost. Digital skills are also a key. So ITU, what are we currently doing to close the gender digital divide? The ITU is co-founder of the Equals Initiative since 2016, and it's been leading the efforts with other organizations working together to ensure that women are giving access to ICTs. And Equals is a successful example of cooperation with more than 100 committed uh, partners in 115 countries. And we've had supported over 52,000 women and girls who have received digital skills trainings and mentorings, and we have done over 146 research projects. ITU is also part of the UN Women Generation Connect Forum process and by co-leading the Action Coalition on Tech and Innovation together with partners, we also tried to scale up the work on equals. 
part of the IQ's work uh, will be celebrated very soon is the International Girls in ICT Day. And I invite everybody to join the uh, 25th of April, where we promote the exciting career opportunities that are waiting for girls and young women in the tech sector. Since 2011, more than 360,000 girls and young women have taken part in more than 11,000 events in over 170 countries. Another effort that ITU does is the IQ Network of Women, where we encourage skilled female professionals to assume leadership roles uh, for our different conferences, and also that we have more women in the technology sector and have more active roles. We, we wanted to also share and, and, and think about, okay, what is ahead of us? And in the case of emerging barriers to take into consideration, and one of this is that emerging technologies are, unveiled, are unveiling a new set of responsibilities and opportunities for vulnerable groups such as women and girls to thrive, develop a career and access support. But despite those advancements, and we're going to talk about AI today in technology, women, including those with disabilities, remain underrepresented in the tech sector, especially in data and AI roles, engineering roles, cloud computing, et cetera. And they also face other barriers like stereotype biases, structural obstacles that hinder their participation growth and safely, safety in the field of AI. We also have inadequate uh, policy regulatory frameworks. Only half of all the policies around the world on ICTs include references to gender and in digital inclusion for vulnerable groups. That has to change. We also have a big digital skills gap on, and that is mostly uh, around uh, technology that we know that is rapidly evolving and that women don't have all the opportunities through scholarship, internships, and uh, mentorship opportunities that are important to break down the stereotypes, biases, and structural barriers that women uh, norm normally have. So what can we do here as, as UN agencies and international organizations? Well, definitely uh, encourage more multi-stakeholder partnerships. We also need to act uh, at different levels, both from the international, regional, and national perspective. All stakeholders need to be involved, governments, national ICT regulators, ICT companies, uh, the private sector, academia, et cetera. And we all need to also advocate for more evidence-based interventions. We cannot try to solve this issue of closing the gender digital divide alone, and we need to know what is happening uh, on the ground. So I, I, I'm going to finalize with, with these comments, and I would like to now uh, give the floor to, to our, our first, uh, what we have two speakers, two amazing speakers, and we're going to have like a 20-minute uh, presentation from both of them, and then we will open the floor to, to anyone who's participating in this online session for any questions or comments. So I hope you put in a lot of questions in the chat and we can then uh, see uh, what, uh, uh, what your comments and questions are. So I would like to start with our first speaker, uh, Ms. Lisette Soria. And Lisette is a gender expert whose work focuses on building bridges between global normative frameworks, policy, and practice through a local knowledge and innovation. Uh, she's a passionate at creating concrete systematic change for women and girls who, who and girls while bringing an intersectionality approach. And she has more than 10 years of experiences in developing uh, and implementing gender transformative initiatives with UN agencies, governments, the academia, and women rights organizations. Some of the innovative gender initiatives she has developed have been featured in the Stanford Social Innovation Review, the MIT Policy Review, and the UN Innovation Global Report. So we'll start with an amazing speaker, Lisette. I can give you the floor. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Silvia. It's my pleasure to be here, and especially on this important day for tomorrow, the International Women's Day. Uh, so happy to be you all. So I'm going to start, go ahead, I'm going to start with a presentation. Um, Anusha, will you be? Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, so today we're going to focus on uh, the project that we have been collaborating with UNICC, which is called Unveiling Sexist, Sexist Narratives. Um, we can go to the next slide. 
Yeah, so we are going to go through the agenda. First, I'm going to go around the problem statement and the objectives of the project. Then, very important, we're going to go deep into the approach because I think this is very important in order to understand the barriers that Silvia was just talking about. We're going to share with you also some of the key findings and then finally our lessons learned. So pretty much why? Why are we here today and why did we start working on this project? Uh, we identified that okay, one of the key barriers uh, of women participation in every level, not only at the workplace, but even political participation, even women in climate change, uh, everywhere pretty much, there has been an issue of, uh, of course, sexism, sexism on the social media. And we know with evidence that the more the sexist comments are on the social media, more women uh, leave the public forum and they go uh, and they leave the, the social or the online platforms. That, of course, has huge implications for their own personal development, but most importantly for everyone. Because if we have less women in the government or if you have less women in peace conflict resolutions, we know already what can be the impact of it, right? So we identified that uh, this uh, there, were, there was an issue of that quantity and the level of sexism in these platforms across the world. Um, and we also, of course, through evidence, we know that this causes gender systematic inequalities and it's, it's based in social norms. I mean, we know already that the root cause of sexism at the end of the day is the imbalance of power and discrimination. So we identified that there were so many, and I don't want to go too much into the example of these social media uh, content because it, it's very harmful and I don't want to repeat those words, but we just pinpoint some of those those examples of how these sexist comments are portrayed. They're using, of course, stereotypes. They are focused on the sex of the person. They are focused on the gender identity of the person. And they are also focused on um, yeah, the different also inequalities, whether the race or other factors. We can go to the next one. And one of the of the um, one of the things that really called our attention also was that we identified uh, through the Sp special rapporteur on violence against women and girls that more jo women journalists, politicians, and human rights defenders were being targeted. Uh, and as I said, they were driving out of the public life. And for example, we give this example of Mexico, how this very important, prominent sport. A figure, uh, she had to leave the country for her safety after these sexist narratives on her Instagram. So the project came out from this, let's call it frustration of why this is happening so much everywhere in the world. And, and we don't know much about the issue. And most importantly, we haven't developed the right prevention or response mechanisms. So the whole um, introduction uh, objectives of, of this project was to have a better understanding of this sexist narrative on social media. Where is it coming from? Who are the ones who are writing this? Uh, when, in, in which month or days this is coming more? Like we wanted to understand better what, what the sexist uh, messaging was telling us. Uh, and with that, we wanted to identify trends and perspectives on how this sexism, sexism is portrayed uh, through different um, overlap of discrimination, whether if, if of your race or LGBTQ. You can go to the next slide, please, Anusha. Thank you. So that was pretty much very concrete objectives was to identify these sexist attitudes and narratives. Second was to develop a robust model to automatically flag and identify this sexist text content on the media, on the social media. And thirdly, to create a safer and more equitable uh, online environment for women and for all. If we can go to the next one. So we, uh, in order to do that, in our, we had to do a taxonomy of how we are going to define and identify this sexism online. So we went back to the international regulations and, and to the international guidelines of the key definitions of what sexism implies, what misogyny means, what violence against women is, what technology facilitated gender-based violence against women and girls mean. Just I want to flag that one of the challenges has been that a lot of these definitions actually are not 
uh, all common agreed definitions. Uh, and that has also been very interesting because, uh, for example, there has been a whole work around how to define technology facilitated gender violence rather than online violence or online harassment. So even from that start of the definition, it was very interesting, it was very important uh, to create this taxonomy to identify the trends uh, of this sexist text context in on, on social media. We can go ahead. Uh, so, and I want to also keep, um, stop here because I think it's super important. Uh, I think the composition of the team, now that we're talking about AI, today uh, is extremely important because one of the issues as Sylvia presented at the beginning is these barriers or these invisible uh, barriers behind AI. One of the key, I think, very interesting uh, uh, um, issue uh, perspective of our project was that we in purpose created a, a team that had a gender diversity age diversity, so we can better understand the different perspectives, the different impacts and the different issues. So we had a very interesting partnership from UN Women. We particularly for, uh, create a partnership with UN Women Mexico, uh, because this is one of the partnerships we have had with UNICC. And then uh, and me from HQ in New York as a gender expert on, the, and on, the, on this topic. And then we had also our experts from UNICC that are morally focused on the AI technology. So already this interdisciplinary team, I think is very important and it has been very useful because we were combining technology with social policy. Uh, and I think for these type of projects, and if we want to create more equal AI systems, it's very important to have multidisciplinary and gender diverse teams. Also, it was beautiful to work with students uh, from the University of Valencia, young women, young men, who were actually great partners and who were super interested to learn more about the, the issue. And of course, the professors and the experts on AI uh, also, that was wonderful to understand. Uh, they, they were also helping a lot with a lot of the data crunching uh, and the whole concept from the design uh, because we wanted to also empower young um, experts. Can we go to the next slide? Yeah, and then I, I will go and, and leave it to my colleague Anusha that will continue with the approach and the key findings of the research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisette. And I think, uh, wow, uh, I hadn't understood what a big problem this is. And then for somebody even having to move away to from one country to another because of this issue. So, so really interesting, re really in very important effort that you're doing. So I want to now introduce introduce Ms. Anusha Dandapan. And uh, she has been serving as the Chief Data and Analytics Officer at the United Nations International Computing Center. In her role, she's responsible for creating and overseeing the growth of data and AI services for uh, UNICC. And Anusha advises and partners with other UN agencies and organizations, industry and academia on solving their business problems by leveraging AI, machine learning, data analytics, data engineering, data science, offerings, and capabilities. So Anusha was featured in the Global Data Power Women list for 2023, 2022, and Data IQ Top 100 Influential People in Data in 2023. So we have a second amazing speaker, and I hope also a lot of people already are putting some questions and comments in the chat. So go ahead, uh, Anusha. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, and thank you, Lizette, uh, for this uh, amazing collaborative partnership. Um, I think uh, uh, have pulling together this wonderful team has clearly uh, showcased that uh, we were not only able to tackle this kind of a, a problem, but also bringing women together to solve for war problems that are focused on women. Uh, this gave us a great opportunity to um, bring that democratization of uh, skill sets and also the expertise that we could bring to the table. Um, without further ado, I want to sort of shed some light on how did we approach uh, this problem. Um, so because this problem, um, though it seems um, very evident, 
we did run into, uh, from a data science perspective, uh, a data collection problem, I would say, because in order for us to understand the specific topic of how um, um, the gender-based stereotypes or sexism is being sort of relevant in the content that we have to collect, because data collection is, is the key in how we approach this problem, right? So for us, uh, we decided to not only focus on one form of channel uh, for the data source. So we ended up choosing Twitter because Twitter, uh, which is currently uh, um, the social media platform X, um, we used the X API to collect the tweets that were based out of Mexico. Uh, how did we qualify that this was from Mexico? We made sure that we um, leveraged the geolocation information um, that you can filter uh, based on the relevant keywords uh, in the tweet. And we use that to not only include uh, different regions, we also were very thoughtful uh, to consider different demographics also, because this problem uh, with the assumption that only the young uh, generation or the young women go through, this is, uh, we wanted to qualify that other demographic age group is also considered in our analysis. And we also included wide variety of topics in our data collection, yeah? So uh, we wanted to see uh, what is the um, um, effect on um, this kind of a population. So uh, we thought through this with a, a mindset that the data collection needs to be so diverse, yeah? And the second thought process that we learned by doing um, is to engage the subject matter expert who is fluent in Spanish and also uh, someone who is very much knowledgeable about the gender issues. Because in this case, we went through a life cycle of manually labeling some content, either whether they are sexist versus non-sexist content ahead of time. So that way it gave us the guideline or the criteria uh, for us to make sure that we are looking at consistent information and accurate information. So that kind of definitely en enabled us um, with the whole thought process. Then we jumped into the model development. And in this case, we very much focused on NLP uh, and machine learning approach, wherein we had to develop a classification model. Um, and these were sort of like, you know, we used pre-trained word embeddings, and we also custom trained a model uh, with the data set that we collected to make sure that the experiment that we performed has this kind of wide um, performance assessment uh, through the, throughout the process, yeah? What I mean by that is model validation is key because perhaps this model performed very well in this particular data set. We wanted to make sure that the evaluation metrics, especially around precision, recall, uh, FN score, and those kind of traditional model metrics, are we, are we able to improve the accuracy or are we very much only focused on generalizing this model so that kind of gave us that um assessment based approach so we made sure that the model is validated uh, we we shared that with our smes and make sure that the and other stakeholders were able to analyze the output and we made sure that the flag content is relevant um, because the insights that we get from this validation process is very, very much sort of the key process in proposing policies and also recommendations for you and women because not only you and women, the other relevant organizations can also use this recommendation. So our thought process was, how can we create a win-win scenario wherein the policy stakeholders are also informed and along with how can we also share this with the academic uh, collaborative partners to make sure that there is continuous uh, improvement and a continuous research-based approach uh, that we can uh, bring to the table. So our thought process was uh, we started with a feminist approach uh, and making sure that we are promoting um, solutions that are not only addressing sexism, but also promoting gender equality because gender equality comes in different forms and shapes when you, when you start dealing that uh, from a data perspective. So how did we go about? We made sure that um, we are transparent from day one. So anything that we work, uh, we work off of a GitHub uh, sort of a repository. Um, this is available in UNICC GitHub. You're welcome to uh, go on UNICC GitHub and have a look at it. And we have also uh, shared the work that we have done so far 
uh, with all of our academic collaboration, in, especially with this UPV collaboration, and it's available in our UNICC website. Um, and we also conducted a survey to validate the feedback as to how did we go about it. The other key point that I want to bring up is that what enabled our approach was the keyword extraction approach. What I mean by that is in the traditional AI development process, um, if you are not able to curate the data um, and in, in, the, in the form and shape that will be um, sort of helpful for you. So for us, it definitely helped us in identifying specific sexist tweets. And it also helped us um, reduce the error rate by 10 to 12%. So because Keto did not only uh, serve us uh, well in identifying the different types of sexism and the emotions that we could extract, but it also gave us the flavor of hate speech that was also very helpful because the flavor of hate speech is very different uh, when it comes to, to um, Spanish language especially and also when you are trying to compare this information with the quality of the keywords that you want to extract uh, when it comes to this specific problem statement yeah so keyword extraction was one of the key steps that we uh, employed in this particular approach and we do believe that more uh, data set that we could gather, the, the diverse um, um, sort of information that we could bring to the large language model, it kind of helped us um, also classify better because uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, we are assessing multiple approaches, especially for example, we used uh, this model called Rosita. Uh, we wanted to confirm that the disagreement and the analysis that we are using, using the Rosita model with the manually labeled sample uh, was relevant with the accuracy that we were looking for, yeah? Um, so, so this is some of the results that we observed. We saw that in a typical day, uh, the performance of our model and how we were able to detect something that was relevant was very interesting. Uh, you could pretty much see that 80% of the content that we saw didn't have that aspect of sexism, but definitely 20% of the information that we saw had this kind of uh, uh, difference between um, uh, different kinds of uh, sexist narratives that has been tweeted. Uh, in one random day in uh, uh, in uh, the Twitter channels, yeah? So what are the technical lessons learned? Well, um, the concept which was very important for us, we clearly identified that we need two models. Uh, one model would not cut the chase. So we figured out that, hey, for the online threats, let's create a classification model. Uh, and we will also use quantitative and qualitative data. So we did perform a pre-assessment survey wherein we identified that other channels are also significant, perhaps Instagram and WhatsApp. Uh, so we did keep that in mind that um, our accuracy of analysis will be uh, only pertinent to one channel uh, for our analysis. The second thing, uh, the data collection, um, we really uh, understood that the data that we collect uh, should not only be uh, repurposed for different uses. So we kind of understood that, hey, there are other ways in which the data that we have uh, collected so far can be shared for academic purposes. So academic research is something that we thought uh, will also add more value uh, to repurposing the information that you have already collected. And the keyword based extraction definitely helped us because it helped us um, clean the data much better. And it also helped us um, annotate the data much better. Um, so I think it gave us also this uh, classification of data, which is homogeneous versus heterogeneous. Um, and uh, it helped us also with the developing and the testing of the model. So you will see that uh, um, we tested with chat GPT uh, in order for us to translate the content. Uh, we also used to transform our models, uh, uh, which we fine tuned uh, specifically focusing on the features that we wanted to engineer the model for. Um, and some of the key lessons learned, uh, I would say the preliminary findings uh, from the work that we have done so far uh, with a specific focus on Guadalajara is that the keywords definitely helped us. And it also helped us align with the taxonomy that Lizette uh, alluded upon because that kind of gives us the framework and the guidance to see how do we want to structure these large language models and specifically re-engineer them uh, to the content that we are um, sort of focusing on. And second thing, we also found that there is a 
fine line uh, between sexism versus racism and the hate speech and the disinformation that we do see um, um, sort of in the data sets. So that relationship that we found at Plenty was also very helpful. Um, the data transformation and the data translation was very, very interesting because we learned that uh, the way the Spanish sentences and the structure of the language is very different when you're focusing on, uh, especially on the content, which is uh, Latin American focus. Um, and we also found out that, hey, we are only focused on one social media platform um, and we were only uh, identifying the things that we could observe for specific times of the day and specific events that trigger uh, this kind of uh, spike that we observe. But however, uh, we do believe that um, this information can support and can help uh, with mitigation strategies. So what we see is that uh, this is a definite value add uh, for colleagues like uh, Lizette and uh, our uh, colleagues in UN Women Mexico, uh, for them to uh, have this kind of an information, uh, not only to qualify, but also to attest the kind of work that we can carry forward. Lizette? Thank you, Anusha. And just building on your last point, also I want to highlight the fact the importance of this model that was able to translate from Spanish to English because most of the AI models uh, is in English. And unfortunately, sexism, it doesn't come only in English, but it comes in multiple languages. So I just want to highlight in, in, in that with that lens of identifying barriers, the importance to develop an accessible AI technology in different languages where we can better understand um, the issues, right? And just building on, on, on those key findings and lessons learned that Anusha shared, I would like also to highlight the lessons learned from the feminine, of applying a feminist approach to an AI model, because this has helped us also, these lessons learned, we hope to use them for other future projects. So one of the key items, as I briefly uh, pinpointed in the introduction, was the importance to diversify teams, right? Because as we know, people shape the outputs and more uh, of uh, any any AI model or any technology product. So the more diversity, the better uh, we will develop um, a more equal equal a uh, solutions, uh, and we can also better integrate different perspectives. The second key lesson learned is to engage with gender experts when you're developing technology as well as uh, in ways that you can, of course. Uh, I think this is important uh, because a lot of people have this understanding of technology as no, it has no gender. Well, unfortunately it has, as we have uh, proved with this, with, with this project. Uh, so it would be interesting. For me, at least, as, as a data person, it was super interested, interesting to contribute by influencing what data sets, what variables, which are the rules of the logarithms uh, that we we decide no, to create these um, AI uh, solutions. So that's very important. Data speaks, right? It speaks out. And um, then another important thing that I believe, another important lesson that came up from this project is that gender, that the data should be understood or desegregated by sex and gender. We do that for any work in any field and more, mostly important in AI, because at the end of the day, we're talking about data, right? And I think here it was super interesting, at least for me, more of a, of a gender expert on the, on the social policy, was very interesting to see the differentiated impacts of different of different groups, for example, when we run the sensitivity uh, uh, test, we identify, for example, in, with some of these sexist narrative, we got a lot of of happy faces and laughing faces. So you wonder who is commenting on these uh, on these narratives, right? Uh, and who is impacted? I, I I doubt that women who go through this sexism and this discrimination will put happy faces to that, right? So that's that's just an example of how important it is to analyze and understand the data desegregated by sex and gender, depending on who is the user and who is being impacted by it. Another thing, 
key important uh, lesson learned was that it is this multidisciplinary field, let's call it nowadays, that AI is more accessible to everyone because before it, had, it was in the hands of few people and mostly men and white. Um, it's interesting to also build a capacity of developers and data managers, right? Uh, we are all learning together, right? So I think that something that I, I, I take uh, and I appreciate from this partnership with UNICC and the vision of Anusha, which is also wonderful to have a woman as a chief of data uh, in, in a technology agency, is that this can help us to better understand, right, the issues and they understand because the, the, the solution is not that I come as a gender expert and say this, these are the issues. No, ideally we want the, the data managers and the developers to be empowered to identify the issues themselves. So when they develop in the future other products, they can already identify the issues, right? Uh, and I think that has a lot of potential, for example, one of the professors who were the leading uh, experts on this project, he himself, he mentioned, he's like, wow, I never, I was never aware of the level uh, of sexism in social media. This was eye-opening to me. And a lot, a lot of the students who participated in the project, especially male, young students, they said the same. They were like, wow, we were not aware of the impacts of this, right? So I think that's extremely important. Is is the process, not only the results. Then, of course, the intersectional lens, as we saw with the what key findings that Nusha highlighted, we identified that unfortunately, unfortunately inequality is complex, uh, but is it is not an excuse for not address it. Uh, and when we're talking about um, gender and sex. A, a discrimination, we have also to identify other forms that uh, the intersection with other forms of discrimination. And finally, I think that one contribution from the feminist uh, perspective uh, and the feminist research that brings to this uh, project was, for example, the do no harm approach. Usually, we, whenever we work with any work on that in, that aims to improve gender equality or women's empowerment, we make sure that we always set protocols and that there are risk mitigations in place. And we make sure, make sure that whatever initiative, whatever project, whatever product we're developing, it won't have harmful effects to anyone. Um, and I think that can be also translated to the AI world. Uh, and I thought that was a, a very valuable contribution from the feminist approach. So that's pretty much it uh, from our side. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Silvia and all the ITU team. Uh, it's wonderful to have partners and people who are working with us because it requires everyone if we want to make AI more equal and accessible to everyone. We're happy to address any questions you might have. Thank you, Lisa. And just by the way, Maybe you haven't noticed your camera is not on, but anyway, uh, I hope you we can see you again. But uh, that's better. <laughs> While you were speaking, it was fine. So look, um, I think if anybody has any questions, anybody who's uh, on in this session online, please uh, go ahead and 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 share them in the chat. Our colleague Julianne will be sending them to us. But maybe to start, and we have like 10 minutes because after this, the idea is that we all go to the video wall and, and do a few minutes of networking. But just just I wanted to, to, to ask you two questions, and it can be for either of you, Lisette or Anusha. First, um, I see that this is very focused on one country in Latin America, as I, I'm, I'm from Latin America. I come from Costa Rica, and I can associate especially the Spanish uh, I speak Spanish, and I, I, I probably would would find some of those those sexist comments quite familiar. Uh, but it, it would be interesting to know if you have any plans of doing the same exercise in other regions uh, and in other languages, because also, also the culture might be different. It's not the same thing. Uh, uh, some uh, and again, and also we cannot bunch up all countries in one region. Mexico is not the same thing like Costa Rica or or and if we go to Africa, uh, of course, there's there's interest, important differences between countries. But anyway, my first question, so I'll put two questions: is Are you planning to 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 so you can strengthen this effort to um, do this also in other regions? 
uh, especially with the lessons learned that you have of how to do it. And my second question is, um, who are you sharing in addition to events like this one? Who are you sharing those key findings? Because I think it's important that uh, at the policy level, uh, uh, people are understanding and and it's and there's awareness around um, the, around this important issue and and this problem uh, uh, around what what we call uh, a sexist narratives in social media. So so are you the key findings? Have you? Uh, I mean, as you said, uh, we said it's important not not only the results but also the process. But from the results perspective. Uh, who are you sharing these key findings? So hopefully those findings and those results can in some way um, uh, create change so so that uh, either through advocacy, education, et cetera, uh, so that we hopefully can reduce and eliminate those sexist narratives. So I leave the two questions for for can one each uh, uh, how you how you wish. You I can talk about Lizette and yeah, sure, sure. And yeah, I can briefly touch into some of these points. So one of the dissemination of key findings, definitely, one of the next steps is to develop a white paper on these findings uh, in collaboration with UNICC and also the government of Jalisco is interested to publish and to do this research. So that is the first step is to put it together in a in a product that we can share and that we can disseminate. Uh, and the second point of strengthening the effort in different regions and languages, I think that's super important. I think it was kind of an innovation to try how to translate sexism into one language just to start with. One, uh, just to, to start developing the model, uh, but I think it's, and I would love to hear Anusha's perspective as an expert on, on the development of these models, but I think one thing that is super important here was the partnership with the UN Women Mexico and the government of Mexico and we and and feminist organizations in Mexico, because sexism is, as you mentioned, is also very cultural. So it's not about a machine doing Google translation. You know what I mean? It requires a lot also of conversation, reflection of the social norms and all that. So. In the future, if we have the funds and and the, and the energy to what well, the energy we will have, but if we have the funds to scale it up in other languages or regions, it's important to always partner with the people who build those narratives uh, in in the respective culture and the respective uh, uh, language to make it more uh, effective. So, Anusha, please, I would love to hear your feedback on that. Yes, um, uh, for for us, if, if you were to look at it from a data lens, Sylvia, uh, uh, we were more excited to look at this problem from a, a data and an AI perspective because um, the input to how we approach this problem actually came from the design thinking exercise that we, uh, Lizette, um, myself, and our colleague Andrea from UN Women uh, facilitated uh, with Guadalajara in Mexico. Um, so, Sylvia, the reason the choice of the region and the choice of the data sets came from a precursor uh, choice uh, because we did go through a thinkathon and a design thinking exercise. Uh, with the government of uh, Jalisco and also we had that kind of an input feeding into our approach of how we are going to leverage the quantitative and the qualitative data that we collected uh, prior to this uh, building out of the AI model. Um, that clearly informed us that we have looked at um, the sort of the human factor in, uh, in involving and building out these AI models because um, we, can, we can identify a lot of inference from data, but if we are not including the human-centric approach of bringing the human together, uh, so we thought of uh, going with the qualitative approach before we jumped into the qualitative assessment of type of models that we could use to detect this kind of uh, sexist narratives in the textual content. Um, and we also figured out by learning by doing that, uh, as you rightly pointed out, Sylvia, that not all Spanish language content are the same. Uh, so we had a very difficult challenge to use and reuse existing content. Like, for example, if in the AI world, there are pre-trained models that are readily available with the assumption that you can take them and plug them and you can get the output that you need. That was 
uh, proven wrong in this particular context because it was not effective. We had to fine tune it. We had to focus on the specific uh, language nuances, especially with the Spanish content coming in from Mexico. Uh, so we learned by doing that, yes, uh, hey, the regional differences are many. However, there is still a common denominator that we can create, which is the trained and the labeled content of data that we can share with other um, sort of uh, partner agencies and also academic institutions. So the thought process was, hey, we are not in this problem solving just by ourselves. Uh, we are designing it together and we also want to solve it together, especially on Spanish language content. Yeah. Well, great. For We have one question. I'll, I've received one question, but I just wanted to finalize this great discussion. And please make sure when you have the white paper, they said uh, we would be happy to share it amongst the, the equals network. I remember we have a strong research uh, component within the equals network. And so, uh, and then also within ITU's uh, gender work. So it would be very interesting once you, you have it ready Again, because in our case, uh, our, our, we work very closely with member states and, and it would be good for them also to, to see this. Uh, and maybe they will be inspired to do it in their own countries and in their own regions. So we have one question. I'm going to read it out um, uh, uh, slowly. And I would like to really um, uh, thank Joel. Uh, he put up questions in the neural network. Uh, and Joel says that, well, thank you for the wonderful uh, talk. So well done, Lisa and Anusha. And he says, I wonder if anyone has cross-referenced these this that this data with other types of discrimination. I ask because we know that one that one one sexism can be accompanied by other types of bigotry. So I'm going to repeat. I wonder if anyone has cross-referenced this, this da data with other types of discrimination and if there's been any, and he says, because there's a link between sexism and other types of bigotry. So I leave it to, to if each one wants to do a, a quick response. Anusha, you wanna go first this time? Uh, uh, yes, we did observe those kind of overlaps, uh, especially when it comes to sexism. There was a clear overlap with abuse, hate, uh, and, and also uh, violent content that had a direct correlation to the uh, data sets that we observed. Um, Joel, uh, Lizette? And I want just to add that definitely, that's why the importance of the intersectional lens, for example, racism is another type of discrimination based on race rather than sex or gender. And also another one that was very, that is really pertinent to your question was technology facilitated violence against women uh, because we identified a lot of correlation between sexism and violence against women and girls. And this is not surprise to us because to us, because we know that worldwide, uh, the evidence says that the prevalence of technology facilitated violence against women and girls online is between 15 to 46 percent, according to the different disparities between nations. So imagine uh, this is very high. And I bet this is not even covering the real prevalence because a lot of this violence is not reported. But yeah, maybe once we develop this white paper, it will be super interesting to do more of this type of analysis with other types of discrimination. So thank you for your question and idea. <laughs> thank you. So maybe before we move uh, now to the, um, how do you say, we move to the, to the, um, close the session because we're going to, we're going to now move to the platform and, and uh, we're, we're going to move to the narrow uh, platform and it was at, at, at 450 Geneva time, but maybe Lisette and, and Anusha, because this has been a super interesting discussion and, and subject, maybe in a short state, last comment, why is it so important to do these type of studies? And why are is also so important to use AI? So 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 maybe Elisette, if you want to start to just like a, a last comment of, of, of why we're doing this. Sure. I think it's super important because I think that that discrimination, the gender discrimination, eh, not in like in, in the normal life, it is translated to the AI world. Right. So this is like all the root causes of discrimination are the same. This is not a new thing. Discrimination is not new. 
but it is new on AI. So I think it's very important to understand this type of research and projects because if we want to make a more fair and justice space for everyone in the world, we also have to include now the AI <laughs> uh, model because if you think this is a virtual reality that can bring discrimination or if we use it wisely, it can create more equality. So I think it's more important than ever now before AI explodes to, an, to the other level that we make sure that it is equal for everyone. Thank you, Anusha. Yes, um, uh, to add on to what Lisa just mentioned, uh, we also believe um, as Doreen from um, SG from ITU uh, alluded to, how can we build uh, AI solutions that are responsible uh, and they all uh, operate with this do no harm approach that uh, we, as the lessons learned that we shared is that we want to ensure that the safety protocols and AI based risk mitigations are in place. So uh, we women um, who are uh, involved, not only involved in this kind of a, a, a theme, uh, we also want to be part of bring, building things together um, using AI. So AI is helpful uh, for us to also uh, create problems, but we are very much focused on solving for problems using AI. Great, and I think uh, Doreen, as you said, has given us all a, a, a call for action and the last AI for Good Summit. I hope everybody joins us this year in end of May uh, and comes and maybe, I don't know if you said, Anusha, if you're planning to come to, to Geneva, it would be wonderful to meet you face to face. Um, and I agree. I think it. I remember I, in my initial comments, I, I mentioned the importance of meaningful connectivity, and it is what you said. Uh, we said it has to be safe. It has to be uh, a connectivity for everyone, and had to be enriching and productive, and that everybody has the same opportunities. So there's one more comment. I'm. I have a Ricardo Rendon Cepeda. And um, so I'm going to read out this comment and maybe if one of you wants to just do a quick response because we, we, we promised to go to the network. So, uh, so Ricardo says a fascinating yet painful look at the reality of social media. So he says, thank you for this important work and insights. So he asks, I'm wondering if you have thought of extending your research into finding cor correlations with anonymity acts, aspects of social media. For example, on X or what was used to call Twitter, you can sign up without revealing much personal info and thus post without restraint. However, on other social media platforms like LinkedIn, your identity is very visible and tied to your professional networks. My initial hunch would be of course, that anonymity is positively correlated with sexism. But would it be more information to see real data? So he's saying if if the if the if the social media uh, uh, accounts are and uh, there's anonymity behind it, that if that there's a correlation with sexism or not. So I don't know if you want to one of you can want to answer. And we're getting a few more questions, so I'm going to try to to just read them out. So Lisette or Anusha, if you can. Lisette, do you want to go first, please? Yeah, we haven't done so, but I agree with your hunch. We have seen the evidence in previous studies that anonymity definitely uh, it will lead to more sexism. Uh, so yeah, I have we haven't done it this for this model, but maybe it's an opportunity to do so. No, Anusha, what are your thoughts? Yes, uh, to respond to your question, Ricardo. Thank you for the question, by the way. It's a very thoughtful. Uh, yes, uh, we did qualify uh, anonymized uh, Twitter handles versus the handles that are uh, verified handles. So we did use the verified handle feature in Twitter as the um, true, true positive uh, handle. And we also used only publicly available data in the sense that uh, not all tweets are publicly available. Uh, so you cannot uh, qualify them as uh, whether they are an individual versus a bot. Uh, so we did make sure that um, anything that Twitter qualified as a qualifiable handle is what we repurposed and reused, but there is a lot of room for improvement and the point well taken, yeah. Thank you. Well, we have one more last comment and this person is even asking, they want to do something similar. His name is Sabahet. Uh, 
I'm, I apologize if I didn't recognize if it's a woman or a man's name, sorry, <laughs> but please, please bear with me. So uh, this person is saying, I'm interested in doing a similar analysis based on Instagram's post in a war, war zone. How can I start? And if I, if, if I were interested in measuring expressions, for example, of grief, of Palestinian women in Gaza, how do I suggest to begin such a project? So, so I don't know if you have any any, any type of, of of suggestions for Salahed uh, if he wants to do something, but based on a war zone. Yeah, no, thanks so much, Salahed. We don't have enough time, and I would love to connect with you uh, to give you more ideas on where to start. So maybe, uh, Sylvia, maybe we can give share my email with okay. them. Okay, I will ask uh, our 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 I, Julian, our our ITU uh, AI for Good uh, moderator, if he can share Lisette's email with Sabahet. Okay, so maybe it's super important. Sabahet, yeah. are you or maybe Lisette, which social media platform are you that he maybe can also try to connect to with you? Yeah, well, LinkedIn is under my name, Lisette okay. Soria. Also, please feel free okay. to join. Happy to support you on this. Okay, his name is Sabahet Brumkai. Okay, and, uh, well, and just to, just to mention, sorry yeah. to jump in, they said her profile, your profile is on our website, on the AI for Good website, so you can find it there as well. Perfect, thank you. So should we now move, so we go off the Zoom, correct, Julian? Just guide us quickly and we go for a few minutes. Uh, yeah, if you could, that'd be great. Thank you very much. Okay, all. so thank you very much for everybody joining this part. Let's see each other in the neural network uh, for a few minutes. And hopefully everybody has enjoyed this really excellent discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you for participating in today's AI for Good session. We hope you've learned something new, innovative, and engaging in today's event. We now encourage you to continue the conversation on the live video wall in the neural network. Here you can ask questions, like and comment, share links, complete the poll, connect with interesting profiles, or speak one-on-one -on -one using the chat and video function. We invite you to explore the lobby, try the smart matching quiz, visit the virtual exhibits, poster boards, the eShop, and build your personalized AI for Good program. Let's shape the future of AI for Good. AI for Good Global Summit convened by ITU recognizes the joint responsibility of governments, the private sector, United Nations agencies, academia and others to ensure AI reaches its full potential while preventing and mitigating harms. And it's a moment that calls for action. And today I'm calling on each of you, each of you to use this summit to help the world to better understand what kinds of regulations what kinds of guardrails we need to put in place right now. So together, let's make it innovative, let's make it safe, and let's make it responsible for all. Thank you very much.